Today I have Russell Bentley with me for interview. Thank you, Russell, for joining me. Good to see you again, my friend. Yeah, and um, happy uh, Defenders of the Fatherland Day. I believe it's a holiday where you are in uh, in that part of Russia. It's a huge holiday in all of Russia. It was originally called uh, Day of the Red Army. You know, it got kind of modernized uh, once the Soviet Union uh, was dissolved, but uh, it's a huge holiday. I mean, the stores are closed. You know, uh, it, it, nobody's working. Everybody's uh, having a big party. Yeah. Russell, I'll just explain to some people who may not be familiar with your uh, life story. You're originally from Texas. You're a former U.S. soldier. And in 2014, you were very disturbed by the violence that is not reported or was not really reported by the Western media. But you had your your information of the the violence, the aggression that the NATO backed regime in Kiev that the NATO powers had installed by a coup with a coup in 2014. They were aggressing the east southeastern part of Ukraine the Donbass region, which has now become part of Russia. You left in 2014 from your nice, cozy, comfortable existence in the United States to take up arms to defend the people of um, the Donbass region. And you're you're now living there. You've got citizenship um, for for as a as a citizen of the um, well, the Russian Federation now. Um, so I just wanted to to fill people in on on that background. Um, and a lot of people are, are deeply in ad admiration for your courage. Russell, um, any regrets going doing what you have done, by the way? None whatsoever, man. It was uh, <clears throat> it was the hardest thing that I ever did. Um, I had, you know, I had a pretty cushy life and a cushy job when I left the States. But, you know, I had quite a, a few uh, hard adventures in my younger years and um, it seemed like all those hard things were just preparing me for coming here. You know, it's, I feel like it's, this is my destiny. You know, this is the place that I've always been coming to. I'm 62 years old now. I've been here for eight years. I could not be happier. I have a wonderful, beautiful, brilliant wife. We have a small house with a big garden. It's close to the front. That area of Petrovsky District gets very heavily shelled. Our house has been hit in just the last few weeks. Uh, a couple of our neighbors, very close neighbors, have been killed um, just in the past few weeks. So, I mean, it's it's far from idyllic. The water turns on uh, every third day. The tap water comes. Um, electricity, it generally works pretty well, but, you know, there's outages from time to time. And so it's, uh, it's a real genuine war zone. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm as happy as I've ever been. And I wonder how many guys, you know, of of my age in the West can say that, you know? Yeah, well said, uh, Russell. Um, Russell, before we, we continue to, to talk about the actual conditions there where you are, you've got some breaking news or some new information for, for a lot of people, I'm sure. In, in the introduction, before we started recording, you, you did mention that your area of um, near Donetsk has been under fire uh, as usual, and um, you you think that uh, your colleagues, your comrades, are are quite confident that the people firing those high Mars rockets are NATO troops, NATO troops in the on the ground in in Ukraine firing those high Mars rockets. Yes, uh, that that's been common knowledge now for you know most of the last year. You know, when as soon as they started sending the HIMARS from the United States to Ukraine, Ukraine has a very, uh, shall we say, low quality of training and low quality of recruits for its army. And, you know, NATO has been sending, you know, undercover soldiers as well as mercenaries with, uh, you know, many years of military experience in Western armies that have, you know, that have been trained and use these HIMARS rockets, you know, been sending them here for years, but especially now in the SMO. I mean, the estimates uh, from Russian intelligence are that there are uh, about 20,000 Polish troops. There are multiple thousands of American mercenaries and uh, active duty soldiers that are posing as mercenaries 
from the US, from Canada, from you know the UK that are here now. And you know these these NATO mercenaries slash uh, soldiers are the ones that are firing the high Mars. It's a pretty. It's not just like a regular old cannon. You know, it's a very uh, uh, highly technological and extremely accurate if you do it right. So uh, yeah, it's yeah, NATO soldiers are definitely working on the ground. And I want to say this too. Uh, ISIS has been working with the Ukrainian army since the get-go of this war, since 2015. There have been, uh, you know, jihadis. I mean, it's only understandable because the CIA created the terrorist battalions of the Ukrainian army, and they created ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and all those. Uh, and so, you know, it's like they have the same parents, and they've been sending the guys here from Syria, you know, from uh, Afghanistan and from uh, Iraq the whole time. Yeah. I mean, the Western media would would claim, uh, would assert that there are no NATO troops on the ground fighting in Ukraine. I mean, the BBC, I, I, I just happened to see a report in the, on the BBC today, um, you know, accusing Vladimir Putin, the, the Russian president, of telling lies in his State of the Union speech this week, and that um, where he was accusing the West of involvement or a big as a war participant uh, in in Ukraine, and then the the BBC said that there are no they asserted that Putin was telling lies. They said there are no Western troops, NATO troops on the ground in Ukraine, but. From what you're saying, that's, that's the BBC is telling lies. The BBC doesn't ever say anything that's not a lie. I despise the BBC. Every single person that works for it is is a prostitute, a a uh, journalistic prostitute, and uh, you know, I mean, only only fools believe what the BBC says. It's the worst propaganda in the West. Yeah. And they are lying. There are absolutely thousands of NATO troops in Ukraine already. Yeah. Russell, what, what, by what means can the Russian intelligence, the Russian military identify these NATO mercenaries? Or, or I mean, I presume they're not NATO troops in NATO uniform. I presume they're, well, they're NATO personnel donning some kind of like uh you know, commando gear that's not identifiably a NATO exactly, uniform. Exactly. I mean, but okay. you understand they have been. Some of these mercenaries have been posting their own videos in 2015 when I was on the front line near Donetsk Airport in the town, little village called Spartak. There's a major Ukrainian army base about two kilometers from where our position was. And monitoring the, the Ukrainian army frequencies, I was hearing guys with British accents on Ukrainian army frequencies two kilometers away back in 2015, bro. And they weren't right. they weren't there, you know, on vacation. Right, right. Okay, uh, good, good point. I mean, there's there's also a lot of. I mean, we've we've already killed and captured, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Right. I mean, what was the guy? Sean Penner and the other Aiden, whatever his name, and those guys. You know, they weren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, uh, active duty soldiers, but they were both British Army veterans, you know, and it's like and we captured them. And for some reason, the, the Russians let them go. But, you know, I mean, they you know, it's it's been it's been irrefutably documented by the Russians capturing them, by them making their own videos and saying, it, you know, where it shows there's whole there's whole uh, platoons or even companies of mm -hmm. uh you know western mercenaries here now you know i mean and what's the difference between a mercenary so you, you know and and a and a regular soldier right so the, these high mars rockets attacks and other rocket attacks like the mlrs this multiple launch rocket system other artillery you're saying are being fired by nato personnel uh, perhaps in mercenary kind of contract under mercenary contract, but these these this shelling of of the the Russian Federation that you're in the Donetsk region is is resulting in civilian casualties, civilian deaths. Uh, more than a thousand uh, in the last year um, of civilian deaths. Um, mm. And the thing is, I mean, the Grad rocket launchers, which this last weekend my wife and I were in the city city center here in Donetsk. And uh, 
We had some grads, which are extremely dangerous, rocket artillery. Uh, we came down within 100 meters of us, which is, you know, it's within the, you know, the lethal zone. And, it, you know, it's, you know, it was, it was a miracle that we didn't get killed. One person did. Eleven were injured. Um, but we were lucky that day. You know, the weekend before that, the high Mars hit in our neighborhood in Petrovsky district of Donetsk. And it's, I mean, and, and today again, I don't know, I, I didn't go to Petrovsky today, but today again in Petrovsky, uh, another person was killed. Some more people were wounded by heavy artillery attacks, you know, there. So, I'm, I mean, the grad stuff like that, a regular D-20, uh, you know, artillery cannon, you know, the U-crops can fire those, and they do. But when you're talking about a high-tech, you know, the more advanced drones, the, uh, the, uh, the the HIMARS rocket system, the UCROPs aren't the ones that are pulling the trigger on those. Right. So, I mean, the implications are then that the the United States and its NATO allies are actually at war here. It's not just a proxy war. They are actually involved. Russell, um, I'm just mindful of, of your time, and I want to get through a, couple, a few more questions with you. And mm -hmm. thanks for given your time under a very stressful situation, a dangerous situation, I must add. Um, now, one year on, Russell, to the day, February the 23rd today, February 24th tomorrow, a year, a year back then, the Russian military intervened in Ukraine, crossed into Ukrainian, ter which was Ukrainian territory then. It's now become Russian territory under referenda and, and Russian law. How do you assess one year on the, the Russian achievements? Of, of uh, they are. Well, OK, first of all, I'll say this. The Russians, you know, and I mean, and it was ridiculous, you know, the propaganda of Western like BBC and, and, and you know, CNN and stuff like that was, um, you know, what they were saying since 2014, oh, the Russians have invaded Ukraine. It was a lie. The Russian army officially and and overtly came in one year ago i mean you know the western propaganda was that it was the russian invasion the whole time that was a lie the russians did help us out with some advisors they helped us out with some ammo and you know and some you know uh, financial support to buy like food and stuff like that economic support but they didn't come in until like you said one year ago today um, and the reason that they did was because the Ukrainian army with NATO planning, NATO weapons, um, uh, and NATO command had amassed, uh, over 150,000 troops along the Donbass front, which a lot of people don't understand that, you know, the front line of the Donbass front is literally on the city limits. I mean, you know, there's, there's. Hardcore fighting going on in Mariinka, and that's, you know, that's, it's one kilometer from the city limits of, of Donetsk in mm -hmm. Petrovsky district. So, I mean, the same thing goes for Makievka, for Gorlovka. Um, and the plan was for the Ukrainian army to make a hardcore, full on assault into these major cities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a blitzkrieg, if you will, and then being in the center of a built up urban area with hundreds of thousands uh, of civilians, you know, right in the same area to use as human shields. That would have negated Russia's uh, main military advantages, which are its artillery, its missile power and its air power. You know, mm -hmm. but I mean, those things don't work too well if you're, you know, in the middle of a built up urban area. And then it would have become, you know, first of all, a genocide and ethnic cleansing on the part of the Ukrops. And it would have become, you know, a very uh, horrific Stalingrad type, uh, you know, urban warfare for the Russians to come in and try and clean them out. So the Russians, they waited till the very last minute, but they mm -hmm. came in right before what would have been, you know, 
uh, a Ru Rwandan style genocide. Yeah. I mean, President Putin this week in his State of the Union address to the legislator, legislators of, of Russia, the lawmakers, um, repeated the, the his claim that the, the, the West started the war, the, 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 the NATO started the war. And, and when he made that claim, he was vilified uh, across the Western media. Boris Johnson, the former British prime minister, was, um, you know, condemning Putin for, for claiming that, that the West started the war. But from what you're saying, Russell, as a person who was actually there in that part of the world, you saw a massive buildup of military offensive force by the NATO backed regime. So you're saying that Putin is actually telling the truth. Of course, he's telling the truth. I mean, and I mean, they they forced the Russian military's hand a year ago, but NATO and the U.S. in particular, which controls NATO, they started the war back in 2014 when they used Georgian snipers to murder, you know, people on both sides during the protest, the cops and the protesters, just to raise up the level of violence. And then they installed a puppet government. I mean, the, the famous uh, intercepted phone call between Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt, who was then the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, where she says, uh, F the EU. And everybody was like, whoo, she used dirty language. But the most important part that a lot of people failed to comprehend was that in that conversation, Newland told Pyatt exactly what person she wanted in which position in the new Ukrainian government. And every single person that she mentioned ended up in exactly the position that she wanted him in. There was no democracy. There was no, I mean, no Ukrainians or no, no voting, no of the Ukrainian uh, parliament having anything to say at all about it. You know, and, and since then, you know, the U.S. in particular, you know, along with NATO, has absolutely controlled every single aspect of uh, Ukrainian life. Not just the government, but the economy, the medical system, the agricultural system, the legal system, the economics. You know, I mean, the whole nine yards. Nothing happens in Ukraine unless the West orders it to happen. And yet uh, Joe Biden, in his speech this week in Warsaw, was declaring that uh, the great benevolent United States was defending democracy in Ukraine. And, um, well, you've laid out a very different uh, picture there. Well, I mean, so Joe Biden is, I mean, he's the only more contemptible, despicable and laughable person that I can think of more so than Boris Johnson, you know, and that's saying a lot, you know. Russell, let me just get back to the the anniversary of this conflict a year on. Now, when it when it was um, ordered, given the the go ahead um, by President Putin last year, the objectives were stated to be the denazification of Ukraine and the demilitarization of Ukraine to to um, remove it as a threat to the, the Russian people. Um, it doesn't seem like that's been achieved at this stage, at this 12 month date. You know, it, it has not only not been achieved. Uh, there have been some, you know, some grave mistakes and some abject failures, in fact, on the part of the uh, Russian high command. It's nowhere near where it needs to be. Um, I mean, and, and there's a lot of people here and a lot of intelligent people around the world in Russia and other places who think that this is uh, a very, very poor strategy and a very dangerous strategy. I mean, the thing is, the West is continuing to arm, direct, command, and also supply, you know, terrorists and mercenaries to the Ukrainian side. They continue to uh, provoke and escalate in every possible way. I mean, they've used chemical weapons. It's a well-known fact that they had biological weapons here uh, in, you know, multiple 
bioweapons labs that were run by the U.S. in Ukraine before the special operation, you know, and there's also the fact that the Ukrainians had a couple of uh, dirty bombs, you know, radioactive dirty bombs that, you know, were already built and that were taken out in the first days of the special operation. Uh, Gostomel Airport was one. They had one in uh, uh, Chernobyl, too, you know, which is, I mean, it's not like a nuclear bomb with a giant explosion, but it spreads uh, deadly radiation for a wide range. And it, I mean, it's also a weapon of mass destruction and a terrorist device. And so, you know, Ukraine and their NATO masters have already used, you know, every kind of, of weapon of mass destruction that there is. And so yeah. as if they continue to escalate, you know, as long as this war goes on, they're going to continue to escalate. And where does that lead to? It leads to a nuclear exchange in World War Three, you know, far beyond Ukrainian battlefield. Yeah. Well, can you see the how the West would have preemptive grounds to crew the, about the failure of Russia? They're saying that Putin and the Russians went in in, in February 24th last year to, de, you know, they would say allegedly denazify Ukraine and to take over Ukraine. But, it's you know, they haven't the Russians haven't done that. OK, they're they're, they're they've they've. Um, They've got uh, sovereignty over uh, maybe 20 percent of Ukrainian territory in the form of Crimea and, and the Donbass region. But the West would kind of mock the Russians as not as failing. They're not they haven't achieved their their goals. It, have they got I mean, you know, can you can you sort of see how the West is making a lot of propaganda out of what would appear to be a shortcoming? Well, of course they are. Of course they are. And. I mean, and, you know, to a certain extent, it's not even propaganda. It's just telling the truth. You know, I mean, the mistakes that were made, the retreats that were made, the civilian, you know, thousands of civilians that have been murdered in land that the Russian army took control of and then rolled back from, you know, the fact that, you know, that Donetsk is still being bombed daily a year in, you know, that's. I mean, the fact that, you know, the war now is more deadly for our guys than it ever was before, you know. I mean, you know, the people, the Donbass militia, uh, the DPR and LPR armies, you know, we held the ground for eight years. And, you know, there's a lot of people here, you know, including myself, who say that, you know, those who defend Donbass also defend Russia. You know, so so would would people in your part of uh, where you're living, uh, Russ, would they would they like to see a more determined, you know, energetic push to um, defeat the 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 Ukrainian the NATO backed Ukrainian military? Absolutely. They, is, is there a sense of frustration that perhaps the Russian leadership is kind of like, um, you know, uh, not taking the gloves off? Exactly, exactly. I mean, and the fact is that, you know, that all of the so-called mistakes that have been made cannot be adequately explained or justified by mere incompetence or even stupidity. I mean, the fact is that the main rail lines uh, of Ukraine still operate, you know, and these it's interesting. These rail lines bring seven hundred million dollars worth of, of of Russian products to Europe every month. Mm. So there's a financial in, uh, incentive for somebody in Russia to keep those railroads open. And the problem is, is that when those trains come back to Europe, they're bringing tanks, they're bringing missiles, they're bringing more mercenaries and stuff, you know. And so somebody's, you know, somebody said, hey, let's not blow up those railroad lines. Let's not blow up the bridges across the Dnieper River, which would be an extremely, I mean, and it's, I mean, it's basic military strategy. The first thing you do is you cut the supply lines and that a year on that still hasn't been done. You know, I mean, 
the uh, the um, shall we say uh, confrontations between uh, the Wagner Group, which is the most uh, shall we say successful military group it's in the military. Uh, yeah, com- and and they have a lot of guys, and they're the guys that have done along with the uh, local DPR and LPR troops that have done most of the hardest fighting here and have made the most gains. You know, and just this last week, there was a problem with Wagner getting their ration of ammunition, you know, and it got cut down, you know, to less than half without explanation right when they're fighting in, you know, the heaviest battle right now, which is Bakhmut or uh, Artyomsk as it's called by the Russians. And I mean, and these kind of facts, you know, it, I mean, it's, and it's like with so many other things you see in the Western governments, but now it's starting to appear in the Russian government that, you know, nobody can be that stupid. It's not a mistake. Somebody's doing it on purpose. Mm. And I mean, and it's costing, I mean, I have a lot of friends in Wagner and I have a lot of friends in the DPR. The reason that Wagner is such an excellent military organization is because they have a lot of veterans from the DPR and LPR armies. I mean, you understand that, you know, our guys have been fighting in the DPR and LPR for eight years. That's twice as long as the Second World War. You know, so they're, you know, they're about as combat hardened as you can get. And, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of those guys have moved on to uh, Wagner because, it pays better. Do you, do you think President Putin is aware of the dangers of this kind of inertia or the, the lack of, um, how would you say, determination to make a, a decisive victory in Ukraine? Well, from what you're saying, Russell, the longer this war goes on, and not only is it a, a, an attritional, an attritional wearing down of, of Russia and, and, and other forces, um, you know, the deaths that go along with it, um, but the danger of a, a nuclear con- conflagration between the NATO powers and Russia. If this thing drags on any longer, um, it's not only counterproductive for Russia, but it's also like a, a, a great risk of, of this war turning into a nuclear conflict. It's a danger for the world. Yeah. Now, do you, th- do you think President Putin is cognizant, or, or very aware of this danger of inertia? And that I, the, the, the I certainly of- hope so. I mean, I hope so. It's I mean, it's just I mean, but the thing is, it's like with the Minsk agreement, you know, recently uh, uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Hollande from France, you know, they, they just came straight out and said in this last year, they said, well, you know, we were just fooling the Russians with the Minsk agreement the whole time. We were just uh, stringing them along, you know, so we could build up the Ukrainian army to be powerful enough to do what we wanted it to do. You know, and the thing is, I mean, in 2017, when I was working uh, on the Avdiivka front as a soldier, combat position, getting shot at every day. And by then, you know, Russian commanders had come in and they were kind of like a co-commander with the, you know, the company or battalion commanders. And these commanders, they said, look, if you start getting shot at on the front, you have to call back to headquarters and get permission before you can shoot back. And we're going to count your bullets when you go to your position. And if you come back with less bullets and you didn't get permission to shoot them, you know, you could go to jail and stuff like that, you know. And so, I mean, that's, you know, if you're trying to build morale, you know, if you're trying to, you know, have a strong defense, that's not the way to do it. You know, I mean, and, you know, the people here, you know, we knew we knew that the Minsk agreement was BS from the get go, you know. But here and then the, the Russians come in and they're ordering us, you know, to basically bend over, you know, to to uh, comply with the agreement, which the Ukrainians never, ever did. I mean, they were bombing civilians the whole time and stuff like that. So, I mean, the people here on the ground have a very, very clear picture of reality, of what's really going on. And Moscow, I've been to Moscow a few times. 
I don't really like it. It reminds me of like New York City or, you know, some, you know, it's, you know, L.A. or something like that. You know, it's full of, I mean, whatever. But, mm-hmm. you know, Moscow is a lot further away from Donbass than just geograph- geographically. Mm-hmm. You know, and the people there, for some reason, don't seem to have a clue. And the people here seem to know exactly what's going on. And then, you know, the Kremlin finally figures it out. You know, some years later, you mm-hmm. know, and 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 it, we and we would tell them we told you so, but we're too busy burying our friends and families that died because of what they didn't figure out. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's real. I mean, you know, I mean, and it's it, it's a real it's a real difficult situation because you know we appreciate the fact we're proud to be Russians. I'm proud to be a citizen of Russia. And we appreciate the fact that they came in and prevented the genocide when they did. But, you know, they 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 haven't given our guys the tools that we should have gotten. Uh, They have uh, sidelined many great commanders that are far, far more competent than the ones that they sent here from the, uh, you know, the military academies who show up with uh, iPhones and shiny boots, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, we understand what's going on. We just don't understand why. And there, of course, there are other, you know, major geopolitical considerations that we, you know, that we don't see here on the front line. I mean, the economic, whatever it is, you know, but but clearly, you know, there's deals that have been made when Mm -hmm. Russia is still selling. I think they're still selling Europe gas through Ukrainian pipelines. In fact, it increased just in the last week. You know, I mean, so they're selling, you know, probably, you know, a billion or billions of dollars of Russian products that Ukraine is getting paid for transit on, you know, and that's going to the people that are sending tanks here to kill Russian, uh, you know, Russian soldiers and, and, and citizens. And civilians, you know, so, you know, it's 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 very hard for us to make logic out of mm-hmm. guys doing business with people that are at war with them. Right. So, Russell, um, about a year ago in May last year, when I had the you know privilege and, you know, to, to, to have interviewed you in May, of last year, you were quite confident of of a Russian victory, military victory. I remember you telling me uh, quite, you know, heartfeltly and sincerely that you, you and quite, um, you know, um, quite confidently that Russia would would win this war, this conflict. Are, are you still as confident? Um, no, I'm consi- not. Not by a long shot. I mean, Russia cannot lose this war. Russia cannot be defeated on the battlefield in a conventional war by either Ukraine or Ukraine plus NATO in Ukraine or in Europe. Russia has the military power to defeat NATO in Ukraine or in Europe. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, you know, just because somebody has a pistol in their pants, if they don't have the determination to use it, then it's all it is. It's 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 just dead weight, or even just a problem for them, you know. And mm-hmm. until you know the political and military determination to do what needs to be done is implemented, then it's just more good guys dying, more bad guys dying, and you know oh. more civilians dying, and and more escalation and more danger. So you you would question the strategic vision or the strategic decision decision making the intelligence uh, that's that's you know being fed back to uh, you know the leaders in in in, in Moscow. You're you're you, you sounds like you're you're frustrated that there there's a lack of um, clarity in what needs to be done. Well, one of the major problems has been that you know they send in these new uh, shave tail officers that have never been in a war before they come in here and they put them in command of you know battle hardened expert you know 
serious soldiers. And then these commanders screw something up and they don't want to take responsibility for it. You know, and so they, you know, they send back reports that, oh, everything's great. You know, we're we're making progress. You know, our guys are doing fine. You know, I mean, and it's simply not true, you know, and that's I mean, that's been uncovered a lot. You know, I mean, there's 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 cronyism, there's uh, nepotism, there's, you know, competition between the different uh, branches of the service and the secret services and like that. You know, and of course, in every army, you know, I mean, and especially in modern armies, you know, the 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 vast majority, you know, the higher up you go, the higher percentage of just, you know, bureaucrats and ass kissers that don't care about anything but their job and their next promotion, you know, who, uh, you know, who, who, you know, who get their stars, you know, by trading the blood of their men, you know, and I'm, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a general, I don't know everything that's going on, but, you know, when Putin says the, uh, the goal is to denazify and dematerialize, uh, militarize Ukraine, and I mean, you know, you don't have to be Einstein to look at that goal and see how far it's gone and see how far we still are away from it a year later, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. as soon as Russia has the determination, you know, and I mean, I don't know what it's going to take, you know, eventually some red line, I mean, but they've, they've said so many red lines already, you know, and uh, I mean, they're, the Ukrainians are bombing inside, you know, what has always been Russian territory now, you know, they're bombing civilians. Mm. I mean, if that's not a red line, they, they blew up the Crimean bridge, which they specifically said, don't touch the bridge. And they're like, okay, watch this. Mm. And then what happened? I mean, it's like with, you know, the Nord Stream 2, you know, the Nord Stream pipelines, you know, I mean, mm. you know, that was multi-billion dollars of Russian and German investment. And somebody blew it up and everybody in the world knows who did it without any question whatsoever. But mm -hmm. so what, you know, I mean, so every red line, you know, I mean, with, you know, with the exception of, you know, I mean, do you understand they even bombed strategic bombers at a Russian um, Air Force base 700 kilometers from the Ukrainian border? I mean, it was done by like uh, sabotage groups. And the, and the drones didn't fly 700 kilometers. They were launched from, you know, a much shorter distance away. But they actually hit strategic bombers, you know what I mean? Yeah. If that's not a red line, then what is? So, Russell, do you think that Russia has the military capability uh, to to do more, to, to do more to close this war? But yeah. For you're saying there's a, there's a lack of political will or, or something. Yeah, I mean, and I, do? I do think so. I mean, I and of course, this is one of the things where I could be wrong. You know, I mean, it could be. And I, I mean, and I don't think I'm wrong. But, you know, it could be that, you know. Russia doesn't have the military capable capability, but I don't believe that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the only other explanation is it's a lack of uh, of, of political will and determination to go ahead and get it done. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, pulling a tooth. It's just mm -hmm. going to keep get being painful and getting more infected until you pull it out, you know? Yeah. So the sooner uh, the sooner you pull it, the better for everybody. Russell Bentley, thank you for your insights and uh, sharing your on the ground information, which is really vital to know. And um, thanks very much, Russell. And I wish you safety for your family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finian. I just want to say in closing that people of the West, it seems like, are starting to understand that Russia is not their enemy. It's the parasite class, the oligarchs, you know, the, uh, you know, the people behind the scenes that own and control their governments and military. That's the real enemies of the people of Europe and the United States. And as soon as the people of Europe and the United States understand that you know, this is a war against them, too, and it is a war of victory or death, you know, and do what needs to be done. You know, I mean, you know, the, the people of Northern Ireland uh, 
understood that they had an enemy along those lines once and they did what needed to be done, you know, and that's that's what I'm talking about. What just exactly what the people of Donbass did when we understood that we're fighting Nazis whose only uh, goal is to uh, exterminate or enslave us. You know, and we understood it's a victory or death type fight. The people of the West need to understand that that's their fight, too. Yeah. And get busy. OK, Russ. Thanks, Russ. Take care. All right. Keep you too, man. Thanks. Finian. Okay.